Good evening. This is like this, this is, is like this a mitzvah. Yeah. It's like a mitzvah. It's worse than that. It, it, thank God it's not a circumcision. I'm bad about to have a bar mitzvah. Hey, it's only that, that, that's only a snip. Okay, welcome everybody. Let's settle down, guys. We do hear that you're in the room, but we we have to give attention to our very honored guests. And I must say, I have to say, firstly, that last year when I asked Martin would he come and help, and we were thinking of doing a panel in YPO in Davos. He was the first one who, with a lack of, firstly, he's well, the only person, do, I'm so. sure, <laughs> he's the only person I know. I he's a man of many man incarnations. Just, just answering email is my work. Yeah. Which he does yeah. literally with alacrity. This is the only man I know. Yeah. I can, any time of the day or night, I, I send him an email, and in, within said, four seconds, you have a Anthony's reply. Anthony's busy, and I have nothing to do. And so thank you for doing that last year and for in bringing Anthony as well. And we're looking for you guys to just give us a thoughts on the week, whatever you want to do. It's your time, your space, and then we're going to end up Wait, with... Let's start with the, the su end. Super Bowl. Who's going to win the Super Bowl? Okay, so uh, I got, you know, when, when, the, ga when the two games are over... Does anybody who doesn't know that we... When we, the two we games are over, I, I, I said that the, the 49ers would be favored uh, plus three meaning they'd win by at least three points. But the line is uh, plus one and a half. So I've, I've got the 49ers, and I'll be down there. Are you going? Because that's where we uh, met I, in 2014. I may go, but you know, I'm, yeah. my heart is with San Francisco. But I, you know, Kansas City is... Uh, so, also, so because one of the, you know, the agencies at WPP, VML, was located. And I actually sent... An, a, it was funny. I was watching it. I couldn't sleep one night. I was watching it in the UK on TV, and I sent a... Uh, a text to John Cook, who runs mm -hmm. VML in Kansas mm -hmm. City, and it, it was half it, getting to half time, and, and mm -hmm. the Titans were up 27 to zero, mm -hmm. and it looked as though they were going to win. And I said, "What's happened to Kansas City?" And it was precisely the moment yeah. at which they they changed. Oh, I mean, Mahomes is arguably excellent, one yeah. of the best quarterbacks ever, but he's got to stay in the pocket with that defense. Now that's so, you've lost. Okay, you've so, lost. Well, right, well, anyway, we have lost fifty percent of the anyway, audience when you talk about the pocket. I love, I love Davos, knows what you're but I love about. Miami a little more for Super Bowl Sunday, right? I mean, we're gonna have a lot of fun. Okay. Out there, All right. So, so enough of that. So okay. So go a, ahead. An evening. We're not going to be an evening. It's going to be about forty-five minutes. It's not an evening. Uh, forty-five minutes, and we're we're going to take about. I uh, will take fifteen, twenty, thirty minutes, and then we'll open it up for questions. You can ask anything you want. I may edit the question if I find it. Overly offensive. But anyway. Um, I've never found anything offensive, so you can ask me anything you want. And by the way, I don't know the difference between on and off the record, and you all know that. So it's, fine. it's all good. Is this, as a matter of fact, is this on or off the record? It's whatever you want it to be. No, it's totally it's on, on the record. On the record. He's got, okay. got 29,000 people watching, but the good news is, the good news is, Okay. I don't know the difference, you know. So you were born... I got shot out of the White House like an Austin Powers villain as a result of that, so it's totally fine. Okay, okay so you were born in 1964. In 1964, I was, yeah. January. I was at the Democratic Convention with Simon Sharma. It was the uh, it was a year after Kennedy was been assassinated, and Simon and I went... Atlantic to, City. Uh, Atlantic City, and it was the, the, the convention where Barry Goldwater had that poster, In Your Heart You Know Is Right. Mm -hmm. And, of course, LBJ came down to the convention floor. We saw the platform hear hearings in, in mm -hmm. Washington. So you were born in that year, yep. 56 now, Italian and American family. Yep. Tell, tell us a little bit. Your, your grandfather emigrated from Italy? Right, well, I guess I can't lie about my age anymore, right? He, like, totally outed me, right? That's fine. <laughs> well, I'm, yeah, I'm, so, I'm so, verging on 75. So, so I'm, well, you look great. <laughs> and uh, what, what I will say about you, uh, I have a tremendous amount of respect for you because... You're constantly reinventing yourselves. And when I've had some bad days, and believe me, when I got fired from the White House, it was a very bad day, you're a symbol of resilience, and you're right. a symbol of persistence. And so I have a lot of love for you. I well, you know, let my, you know my that. motto but, when I got knighted is yes. persistence and speed. Amen. So, Amen. So, I mean, you are a great role model for all of the young people in this oh, room. Oh, you're such a schmoozy. Fo He's hoping story. that the questions, the questions. Are <laughs> okay. But let me, let me, let me, let yeah. me just answer Talk that question. I think it's, I think it's important. So, you know, in, in the southern Italy, uh, my grandfather would say no lavora, there was no work, and so they left, okay? And they really did think the streets were paved with gold. Right. And so they, gave, they came here, and when they got to Brooklyn, there was a little bit of rude upbringing, uh, you know, because upbringing is the wrong word, but there was a little bit of a rudeness there because there were signs in the store shops that said Nina, which stood for no Italians need apply. So uh, 
they're modestly educated, and they could have done better jobs than the ones Did that they Did they speak had. English, right? Yeah. yeah my, my grandfather actually could speak a little bit of English. My grandmother, no. But my grandmother at 18 was a maid. She couldn't get a job in a store, so she was turning beds. So every time I'm in a hotel room, I think, okay, this could be my grandmother. Okay, and so I tell my staff, you got to treat the people below you with dignity and kindness. It could be somebody's grandmother, okay? And you have to always remember that by people because we're going to get into management style in a second about how people operate. So now they come. They're working with their hands. They are laborers. My father's family is a family of coal miners. They land in, in they land They land in Ellis Island. They yeah. go to Brooklyn. They end up out on Long Island. Right. My father's dad married to my grandmother. They went to Scranton, PA, the town of Joe Biden and Hillary Clinton. You know, when I listen to Secretary Clinton on TV, she sounds like my Aunt Eleanor because they all have that same watery northeastern Pennsylvania accent. And so there was my dad in a coal mining depressed town where my grandfather died an early death, and he insisted to my father not to go in these coal mines, okay, because it was a form of northern slavery, frankly. Mm -hmm. And so my dad responded to an advertisement in the classified ad section to mine sand on Long Island. And so you don't need a geography lesson from me, but Long Island is a remnant of the last ice age. And so when the ice receded, it left Block Island, Long Island, the elbow of Cape Cod, Nantucket, and Martha's Vineyard. And in the town of Port Washington, it was the largest granulated sand deposit in North America. And so Italian, Welsh, and Irish immigrants mined that sand for 95 years. In 19 was this related to the concrete industry? Yeah, yeah. absolutely, yeah. yeah. Because here's what happens is that sand goes onto a conveyor belt, it goes on a barge, it gets shipped to Long Island City. That's where the big concrete plant was. In 1909, the Queens, the 59th Street Bridge was built, and the, the 59th Street Bridge is the George Washington, the father of the Manhattan skyscraper, because once they could get the concrete off of Long Island into New York, they started building. Well, the concrete industry was controlled, wasn't it? It was controlled by it certain was. parties. Yeah, it was. Certain yeah, parties. Unions, were. mafia, they were yes, all in there. That's yeah. right. My dad was a laborer, though. He wasn't involved with that stuff. He was a, uh, I, I told De Niro that my dad was like the uh, bus driver in. Uh, the, the Irishman? No, the bus driver in the Bronx Dale. He okay. was, there was no funny. My dad is the kind of guy where if he got a parking ticket on Main Street in Port Washington, we were walking to the post office to get a money order to pay the parking. All right, so your so, roots, so, those were your roots. So those, those are my roots. roots, and so now... But you end up going to Tufts? Yeah, so when Harvard I get into Law Tufts, my, my father thinks Tufts is spelled T-O-U-G-H-S. He has no clue, right? <laughs> I mean, it's like a real joke, but he's a lie. He'll tell you that. And when I got into Harvard, my mother thought it was Hartford Law School, so she was like, are we going to Connecticut? I'm like, ma, no, it's, it, it's Harvard Law School. She's like, well, why would they name it Hartford Law School if it's not in Hartford? <laughs> okay, because... That was my family. They were blue collar. But then people. you went to Goldman Sachs. So then I went to Goldman Sachs. There before for I got to years? Goldman, I want to frame this for you. I was a hundred percent flammable at my first interview. I was a hundred percent poly at my first interview. Okay, so I had a polyester suit. I had a polyester shirt. I want you to imagine in the UK me getting this job. Okay, I had a black, thin polyester tie, fully flammable. White, for the did job. you have white socks? I didn't have white. I had black socks, but I had capizos. They were cockroach killers. They were like pointy dance shoes. Okay? So I walk into the Goldman interview. I, my hair's blown back like John Travolta in Saturday Night Fever. And they're asking me questions about the TED spread and LIBOR and net present values. And I'm, I'm answering every question. The guy gets up. He walks out of the room. He says, he, he said, dude, you're, you're a smart kid, but you are the worst dressed person that we've met at the Harvard Law School. <laughs> okay, so now I'm like horrified, right? So I, I call my mother. I'm like, the guy says I'm like the worst dressed person. My mother, right, typical Italian mother, he doesn't know what he's talking about. Yeah, you looked amazing, right? <laughs> but I was, I was the worst dressed, okay? So I had to go get a credit card. I had to go to Brooks Brothers, and I bought my first wool suit. So that's the family I grew up in, no country club, know anything, okay? My first inside the corporate arena, inside a corporate office building. But wait, wait, wait. You were, you, were, yeah, you were there seven years, and you were fired at Goldman and then rehired. That's true. Now, so yeah. what, tell, <laughs> I get fired a lot. Tell me the story. Here, you know? Tell me the story. Okay, How John Kelly fired? Fired. I, I get fired a lot. So what happened was <laughs> they, they hired me, and uh, yeah. we were going into a real estate recession in 1990. It was the Gulf War. And they hired me, and they promised me that they were going to train me. Because remember, I was coming from law school, so I didn't have those technical skills on the spreadsheets that some of my colleagues did. And so we went into the downturn. I was last in, first out. And one of my that's, best, your, that's your story. You know Mike Facetelli? No. 
Okay, so Mike Facitelli was my, my, he was the guy running the area. He had a couple of great lines, but one of them was, Mooch, you know, there's only five Italian partners here at Goldman. Well, one of us is going to have to die to make you a partner. <laughs> that was a great line. But he fired me, and he said, you know, you really suck at this job. Okay. And so I could keep you because I like you, but that's going to be a really bad thing for you because you suck at the job, and so you need to find something else. So young people, if you're listening to this, it's okay. You know, you can survive it. Okay, so I get fired. But you got rehired by another department. Yeah, so then this is the thing. Don't burn a bridge when you're getting fired, okay? So Mike and I were close. It's a no problem. And then I got a phone call from one of my buddies. He said, hey, there's a job opening at Goldman Sachs. Okay, so this is a totally true story, Okay. $11,000 severance check I got the day I got fired. I was going to ask you, did you get something on the way out and yeah, something yeah, yeah. on the way in? Yeah, this is the best. Okay, I got 11000 on the way out, February 1st, 1991. I got rehired, okay? Tony Infante was running uh, Human Relations. She just retired. She's like, Anthony, I got really good news for you. You can tell everybody that you got interdepartmentally transferred. You're never going to have to tell anybody you got fired. Can we get the $11,000 back? <laughs> I was like, I was like NFW. You could tell everybody in Davos, Switzerland, I got fired. I could care less. I said I, I, I already spent the money on wool suits. Okay, so I'm totally fine. Right? So anyway, so you, you get rehired. I'm now rehired. And then, and then you leave after seven years and you start Oscar yeah, Capital. Yes, start start Oscar Capital. We're in the hedge fund space and uh, registered investment advisor space. We raised a billion dollars. Uh, my partner was an amazing guy. He's now retired. He's a couple years older than me. He was from Greendale, Wisconsin, a suburb in Milwaukee. Great Midwestern values. Learned so much about generosity and kindness from him, you know, in addition to my grandparents. So we sell the business to Newburgh Newberg and Berman, right. uh, six weeks after the terrorist attack. Okay. And so now we're over at Newburger and we're running our business, and Newburger sells to Lehman. That's so about now, 2005? That was October 2003. So now I'm at Lehman. And, How much uh, money did you make on that deal? A lot, actually. Yeah, I was uh, that was a transformative deal for me. Yeah. Uh, I haven't. I will tell you this. In cash, no paper. Uh, it was it was cash. It was a small slip of paper that I held until the Lehman merger. So I made a little bit more money there. But here's the thing about that transaction that changed my life, because I was able to take care of my folks. I renovated their house. I took care of some of my family members, and I've never really changed my lifestyle from that day. So I live two miles from my folks. I mean, I'm an Italian mama's boy from Long Island, right? So I live two miles from my folks, and it never, I never changed my lifestyle. So I've been accumulating the money so I could have some level of financial independence. So why did you leave Lehman? So I'm, I, I left Lehman because I, I was an entrepreneur like yourself. Yeah, right. And so I went to Dick Fold, uh, and I said to Dick, um, my contract is up. I would like to leave and start a business. He was fantastic, okay? And him and I have a very close relationship to this day. He funded... Skybridge Capital. So, so he, he gave he me balance sheet capital, and he helped me get the business up and running. And so here's what you need to know about your life. If you're an entrepreneur in this room and YPO, so much of your life is providential. So much of it is accidental. You're working hard. But you hard. make your own luck. That used you to make say your you own, make your own you make, luck. You make yeah. your own luck, et cetera. But think about this. The day I started Skybridge Capital, March 7, 2005, if there was a crystal ball in my hand and it said, okay, here's what's going to happen. Skybridge is going to go on to have $12 billion, but Lehman is going to be the largest bankruptcy in American history. There's no way you would have thought that. Okay, so a lot of things happen that are very improbable. Be nice to people because when bad things happen to you, they'll come help you. Be nice on the way up because you might meet them on the way yes. down. Yes, you know, That's when right. I got fired from the White House, I can't tell you the number of people that called me to offer me help and support. And so, you know, my son is here. He's graduated from Stanford Business School. My message to him, all the younger kids here, be nice, okay? Be nice, be gracious, because you're going to have something go wrong. You know, when you're 25, you're idealizing your career. You think it's going to move at a 45-degree arc, but it doesn't. It moves, I mean, a little bit like Donald Trump's signature, like a cardiac arrest, right? I mean, the thing's moving like this, right? Right? I mean, so no, anyway, like a, so that brings us, okay, so. We'll, 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 we'll cut, we spent a bit yeah, on so, the background, which I think right, is so, interesting, but we'll, yeah. we, we so fast start, forward to today. Now, now, look, let's, can let's, I just say let's one do, more thing, because you know, no, I'm no, you can't, okay, no, right, you can't, right, no, right. no, you can't, no, you can't, otherwise we won't have any time left. Right, so, so let's, let's fast forward today, because you've got okay. Skybridge, your SALT conference, you're really a competitor to Davos, aren't you? Your SALT is in Las Vegas? 
Yeah, no, I would say we are a collaborator, definitely not a competitor. You know, uh, Michael Milken's a great friend of mine. Uh, he has a conference. He was my first keynote speaker at my conference. I think there's so much space for these conferences. And I think what has happened, why there's a proliferation of these conferences is because of these phones. So what happens is we're interacting with each other through that black mirror, but we need to see each other. And so we go to these conferences. And you just you go spend your whole life at conferences. You? I love conferences. You I mean, like the whole of too. January come on, come is on. a one long conference with CES you, you, and you Davos like, and everything you, else. You like them too. That's no. why we, you and yeah, I are but there's pals. Too many, there's too many of them. I think we should I mean, we, we, we read a, like a little bit now. like that. Who would be Felix and Oscar in this relationship? <laughs> <laughs> I'm now, way look, messier than Martin. Let's I'm get, just letting let's you get know. to the nub of the question. Yes, okay. Okay, so now you've fallen out of love with the president. And I went back through your history and Mm -hmm. You've been a supporter of Hillary Clinton, of Obama, of Romney. You then criticized Trump. You supported Hillary, Scott Walker, Jeb Bush. Then you became a Trump supporter, and now you're not a Trump supporter. So you, you, there's been a certain amount of volatility. There's not been a consistent... <laughs> uh, uh, there's not been see, consistency. I, I, see it as, I see it as like I a zero... I know consistency is the hobgoblin of small I, minds. I but, see it as a 0 0.1 beta. Can I explain okay. why? Yes, go ahead. Because when you're coming from nowhere like me and you have to build a network and you have to meet people, um, I didn't have a list of people I could go to, so I had to create one. So my first check into a political campaign was to Rudolph Giuliani. I was 25 years old. It was 1989. I wrote a $250 check. And he lost that election. And so he won the subsequent election in 93. And he introduced me to uh, Governor Pataki. I became very close friends with him. I was running you know, part of his young person's campaign. And of course, Rudy does what Rudy does. He endorsed Mario Cuomo while we were working <laughs> for Pataki. Right? So, so, but why did I do this? I did this for the agnostic reasons of building a network. So the Hillary Clinton stuff, I got a phone call in 2000 from one of my largest clients. They said, you know, I'm a friend of uh, the first lady. I need you to write a $2,000 check. So I wrote it. That was the extent of my fundraising for her. Different story with President Obama. I went to law school with President Obama. But I didn't really know him in law school, but my, I had several friends. Some of what, was it, what was his reputation in law school? So, again, I, I'm not one of these guys. Like, all the faculty at Harvard pretends that they taught him, mathematically impossible. And everybody that was at Harvard Law School during that period says they know him, also mathematically impossible. But, but my friends that knew him really liked him. They said he was, you know, sort of like what he is today. You know, he was a very urbane guy, uh, a, a chill sort of a guy. And uh, Did they ever think and, he uh, might become remember, president? Uh, I don't think so, because he was a little wayward in the beginning. And so, you know, he was... Uh, community organizing, he was doing uh, some teaching of constitutional law, and then he decided to run for the Senate. Was he on law review? He was. He was the first African-American president. Were you on law review? I thought, come on, you know the answer. <laughs> <laughs> well, I graduated, like everybody else, in the top third of the Harvard Business School. Did you? Yeah. Everybody like everybody else, yeah. Third. Anyway, so... I graduated yeah. in the yeah. bottom third of the Harvard Law School, probably. <laughs> I have no idea. But but here's the thing about, here's the thing about a, a president, okay? So my buddies are saying... Mooch, you got to go to this thing. I said, Prine, I go to this fundraiser. I got a check in my pocket, okay? I turn to Senator Obama. I say, okay, listen. I said, we didn't really know each other in law school. I want to tell everybody that we knew each other. I'm about to give you a big check. Are you cool with it? Obama looks at me. He's like, if you double the check, we could take it back to Hawaii. <laughs> <laughs> Is that great? Right? And you know he said it, right? And, and let me tell you something about Obama, okay? When he smiles, he lights up the room. He has the best smile in American politics since Jack Kennedy, okay? He lights up the room. But was he a people person? So I did double the well, check. Wait a minute. Is he, is, he a, is, he a, is he a people person? Because uh, a lot of people, people say no, he's more that he was good, at, obviously a good speaker, but, he, but in a room, he wasn't as... Or on day to day, he was not a people person. Not, not, not like a Clinton. Well, look, my experience was... Now look, you're... I mean... He, Clinton was the alpha to the third power of people, people. And right. he loves people. He's a gregarious guy, and he loves people. President Obama, I would describe more as a wonkish person that loves people, but he's a little bit more introverted than mm -hmm. President Clinton. Mm -hmm. But a great orator. He's a great intellect. Um, I think the president's mistake was probably going a little bit too tribal. In 2004, when he said that this is a nation that isn't red and it isn't blue, it's red, white, and blue, and he said that in Boston, um, keynote address for Senator Kerry, who was going to be the nominee, he should have stayed with that. So what happened was he got the job, and then he hit hard blue. Okay, and so what did Van Jones from CNN say? President Trump is a white lash 
and a reaction formation to President Obama. Okay, and so what these two uh, did, and I'm not saying they did it intentionally, but we've created this tribal split in the country, mm -hmm. and now we need transformative leadership. We need somebody that recognizes that the first name of the country is United. We have to bring the country back together, and we have to restate the mission of the country. And just like everything in life, your business, my business, the people's businesses out here, they need to be re-engineered, they need to be retweaked, they need to be reset, and we need to be reminded of the virtue of the country and the values of the country. Sure, the country's history is fraught with uh, bad things and racism and slavery, and, and I'm not trying to paint a perfect picture of the United States, but when Lincoln was writing that second inaugural address, and he called it the last best hope for mankind, he was expressing that we could be an identity of many cultures. You know, and when Lee Kuan Yew talked about the United States, he said, hey, you can draw upon seven billion people, and in five short years, they become Chinese American, Italian American, uh, Turkish American. But the other nations, they have a hard time doing that. And so we have to go back to that. We have to let's, think about let's the just ideal come back. Okay, of what so you we went are. you went through these various sort of peregrinations, these because just like Trump's signature, you were very volatile in terms of your political affiliations for practical reasons? Building a network. For yes, practical absolutely. reasons or whatever it happens to be. Now, No, it, for practical reasons. I'm less ideological. I'm probably a rightish leaning person from the economy and from regulation. I am as far to the left as anybody could be on things like gay marriage. Joined, and, but you joined the transition. I did. Yeah, well, yeah, I worked, I worked for President Trump. So you yeah, worked for President Trump. Yeah. You had a couple of jobs with Director for Office of Public Liaison. What the hell is yeah. that? What job is that? So that was a cool job. Okay, that was the job I should have taken. It's so, not a cool title. So, so let, me, let, me set the, let me set the tone. Okay, he wins. Okay, and if you didn't catch the nervousness of him winning, then you don't really know him because at 6.30 p.m., we did not think he was winning. I was hosting Wall Street Week for Fox News, and I was at the Fox News decision desk meeting where Chris Steyerwalt handed out a memo that said Secretary Clinton is going to be the 45th President of the United States. And they got some polling data wrong, exit polling data in Florida. So we were prepared for him to lose. He had not written one speech or the other, too superstitious for that. But at 10.30 at the Hilton, at a VIP donor thing, because I was mm -hmm. one of the campaign people, I was sitting on a couch with Rudy Giuliani, my friend for a very long time. On the TV, he looks at me and says, we're going to win. He said, you see those precincts in Florida? Those are white collar precincts. Those people vote late at night. They're gonna vote for Trump. And he was right. And then boom, the New York Times went from like 30% to 98%. Yeah. And he was white as a ghost, white as a Did ghost. Did you think yeah. that Trump would win? No, I mean, no one on that thing. <laughs> Nobody thought he was gonna win. If anybody is revising... Ja Jared, Jared Kushner was con convinced he was going to win. Yeah, today he's saying that. Okay. No, 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 that's not fair. Because I, okay. you know, I did a conversation with him before the election, and he was convinced. I mean, okay. maybe he was just saying it, but, but he okay. was convinced. I was with it. everybody on election night, and we did not think we were going to okay. win. And the president, the president admitted that at Cipriani's a week later. This is one of the funny parts of the situation. We did a, an event at Cipriani's in June of 2016. We couldn't get anybody there. Every Scaramucci from Long Island was in the place. Like, I was calling everybody. My clamming cousins, deli cousins. Come on, you gotta. They all got pictures of Trump. Of course, they've cut his head off now because that's what Italians do when they're mad at people. They cut the, <laughs> cut the head off the picture, right? So, so now they, they they're they're all there. But in December, when he won, the place was packed, right? Everybody loves a winner, right? So, so Trump wins. He names me to the transition team without telling me, right? Wednesday morning, typical management style. He says, you're going to come work for me. I said, no, I'm not. I'm hosting Wall Street Week. I've got Skybridge. I built it myself. Had you, had you decided to sell, sell Skybridge at that time? To no, no, then? I didn't. I, I said, this no was way. before. Way so before. now on that Friday, he names me to the transition team without telling me. Doesn't even tell me. <laughs> to do what? Just generally? To be interview, interview cabinet secretaries, undersecretaries. He wanted me in media advocacy for the transition. So I'm like, I get on the phone. I'm like, you name me to the transition team. I said, you didn't even tell me. He said, no, no, it's fine. You're coming to work for me. Okay. So now I but go. But you agreed. Well, you know, he's the president of the United States, and this is what happens to people when they're around power. I'm a human being. You're a human being. You could be sanctimonious and self-righteous and pretend you're better than me, and maybe some of you are. Maybe you know, I've set a low bar, so maybe some of you really are. <laughs> but let me tell you something. When you're, when you're with the president-elect of the United States, and he's asking you to go work for me. Maybe you had this like blue collar, American dreamish arcing experience that you, 
You're so Toronto. what is this you office for public liaison? What you said so, so, so he says to me, I want you to be the OPL director, the Office of Public Liaison, which is effectively to be the president's chief networking officer. Okay. And so they announced that I'm going to be that, and then I concurrently put the company up for sale because I think that's the right thing to do if you look through the ethics, right? Remember what I said about my dad? He's paying parking tickets in five minutes after he gets them. So I put the company up for sale. Why so did you can... choose h and or... Okay, so we had four bids. Greg Fleming, who I think you yes, may I know. know. Yeah. Greg Fleming was o uh, operating the auction. We right. had four bids. We had a higher bid from a New York-based firm that was going to let go 40 of my employees. We had a $12.5 million lower bid from h and but they made a commitment to us that they were going to keep all the employees. And I was leaving to go serve the government, and these people helped me build that company from scratch. So I said, okay, fine, I'll take less And if money. you'd have sold it, you would have got the benefit of capital gains tax? Yeah, temporarily. It's a deferral. Yeah, so, but, yeah. but, but here's the funny part about the whole thing, okay? My lawyers told me, well, you're going to have to go through CFIUS, and uh, here's the technology subscribers. You want to hear the technology subscribers? We had a flat-screen television. We had a flat-screen computer and we had a telephone that I'm aware of. That was our, we got blocked at CFIUS. It was a national security reason why we couldn't sell the company. So you, you guys figure that, okay, maybe you know Washington better than me. I was only there for 11 days. So they blocked it, they blocked the thing, no problem. I'm a big boy, no whining. No, when I got fired, it was But then the, you were the U.S. import export bank. So, so, so now, now we've got, so, so then the president calls me and I said to him, and by the way, I was supposed to have that job Priebus and Bannon, they did a Washington two-step on me. They blocked the job. And Bannon, in particular, was very upset with me. This is the public liaison. Yeah, yeah, because, because uh, Klaus Schwab, who introduced President Trump to Klaus Schwab? Well, that would be me. So Klaus called me. I've been coming here for 10 years. I love the place. Klaus calls me. You're the only guy I know. I said, oh, come on up. I called, I called Mr. President-elect Trump, and we met with him in his office. They had a great meeting. It was a really funny meeting, by the way. I don't want to talk about it because it's on the record, but it was very funny. And Klaus was great. Why can't you talk about it? This, this will no, make no, it no. really interesting. Come no, on. no, no, Come on, no. Klaus will be mad at me. No, no. Come no. on, no. I'm getting invited back. And where's my, <laughs> where's my white badge, okay? I'm not. I'm getting invited back. So, so anyway, but Klaus and I, uh, and I introduced him, and, but this is where Bannon swore at me. Because if you read any of Bannon's writings, he's anti-globalism. He's America first. I mean... The major contribution I've made to our civilization thus far is getting Bannon out of the White House. Could you imagine those two nut jobs in the White House right now together, <laughs> right? I mean, you know, crazy and crazier in the White House right now. I mean, thank God we got rid of him. So now I call Trump and I said, listen, these are two very bad guys. I said, we want to get rid of them. Call me. So the first call this was... This is Priebus and Bannon. Yeah. So the first call was, what do you know about the XM Bank? And I said, nothing. He says, okay, yeah, I don't know anything about it either. He says, Rand Paul wants to close it down. Okay. He says, uh, okay, so go to the XM Bank, and uh, I want you to spend three or four weeks there. We're going to name you the chief strategy officer, and go through the XM Bank, and then you're going to write a report. I said, I'm not writing a report. You're not going to read the report. Okay, and he's like, okay, you don't have to write the report. Just tell me if I should keep the XM Bank open or not. I said, okay, fine. So I went to the XM Bank. Who was, who was okay. the CEO of the XM Bank? Uh, well, so we didn't have one. So you know, that's a presidential appointee. Okay. And so the Obama person had left, and he was figuring out who to okay. appoint to the exit. Bank. We didn't have one. So I went over there to interview everybody, and I firmly felt that we needed to keep it, and I had all my reasons why, and I debated that with Senator Paul. And so I told the president, you got to keep this thing because we got $30 billion in it. The Chinese are, are ripping through $350 billion, and whether you like it or not, capitalism, the state of capitalism has changed, and we have to keep the bank. So he, he agreed to keep it. So then he calls me on Thursday, July 20th, the moon landing day, 2017. Where are you? I'm at the XM Bank. That's where you put me. He goes, yeah, where is that? Is that in New York or Washington? <laughs> I said, across from the White House. Oh, that's great. He goes, come on over here. I want to talk to you. And then he said, I want you to come in here. I want you to help me clean this thing up. Now, let me well, tell you. When you say clean this thing up. Let me get rid of Bannon and Priebus. Two big leakers, they were hurting him. You guys don't remember, you think it's bad now. It was very bad back then. I'm in the study off the Oval. We're talking about it. I said, no problem, I will handle it for you. And let me give you colossal mistake number two million in my life. I put my pride and my ego into that decision making, okay? 
I should have never done that. Okay, because I'm not. You should a, never take the job. No, because I'm not a Washingtonian. I don't know how Washington <laughs> works. I'm a New Yorker who has his own business, and I'm an entrepreneur. And he's offering me the job, and I'm taking the job because I want to go after those two guys. And they killed you. That is a they very, killed you. They, they effectively very, killed you. Intensely. Yeah, yeah, that was very stupid. Because here's what happens to you when your pride and ego are engaged: your emotions go up, and your intelligence goes down. And then you start to make mistakes, and you start to have vulnerable decisions. What was the make. mistake? That interview with was it the New York Times? No, there was a number of different mistakes. I mean, that was a very big one. I mean, but that to me, I forgive myself for that because the guy I was talking to was like a family friend. You know, he his father worked with my dad in the same construction. This is the reporter. Yeah. yeah, And so he was a he was a family friend from Long Island. He was an Italian American, and I was off the cuff. I said something totally inappropriate, which I did apologize to the vice president and. President Trump for it was a totally inappropriate. It was very effing funny, but it was inappropriate. <laughs> I mean, you know, but I mean, I shouldn't have said it. I didn't think the guy was going to run to the, you know, CNN with the tape and stuff, right? So, I mean, I, I trusted him. And so I never blamed anybody for my firing or myself. When General Kelly fired me, I said, no problem. I made a mistake. I'm here to make the president look good. That made him look bad. You guys don't want me here. I'm cool with it. I handed it him my comms plan. You should read my comms plan. You would like it, actually. It was a... Uh, I handed it to him. Somebody from the White House who obviously liked me because it's Leak City, they leaked it to CNN. So if you go to Scaramucci comms plan, you can read my nine-page comms plan, right? And, I, and I, I got fired, and it was humbling. It was frustrating. It was mischaracterizing. It was all of the things that you would expect, the disfiguration and the characterization that happens in the media. But why did you fall out of love with Trump? Well, that's a different that's a different story. So now, so now I leave the White House, and I'm back on television two weeks later with uh, Stephen Colbert. He looks at me and said, do you think you were going to last a long time? I said, Stephen, I thought longer than a carton of milk in the refrigerator. I didn't think I was <laughs> going to get blown out like that, right? And, 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 but I took it with some level of aplomb and self-deprecation, and I moved on. And I stayed loyal to the president, okay, because I worked for him. And he's got a very tough job. What was it and like so, to work for him? It's a run-on sentence, you know. It's a lot like when he does these meetings there. It's a run-on sentence, you know. He's just, bl he's on blast all day long, and it's a run-on frustrating sentence, and he doesn't like listening, and he's got two major weaknesses, which you know. Weakness number one, there are no co-stars. There's one spotlight, it's on him. Ronald Reagan had a uh, sign in the Oval Office that said, you can get anywhere you want in life as long as you don't care who gets the credit. The president is the exact opposite. I get all the credit all the time. If he says two things to you, you better run. Thing number one, ready? <laughs> You're getting more famous than me. You better, you, better, you better fly to Argentina on like some state visit, okay? <laughs> you gotta get out of the news right away. And then the second thing that he says is, oh yeah, I read about you giving me that idea in the paper. President Bannon, President Kelly, President Mattis. You see that? All spotlights are on him. That's an insecurity, right? We know that. You can't handle yourself like that if you're running an organization. And so. That's what he's like. So now I'm loyal to him, no problem, loyal to him. I got a business now, Martin. I go, one of the great things about getting fired from the White House, if you own your own business, you return to your own business. The deal with the Chinese had collapsed. Deal, it, it had, well, not yet, but it was in the process of fading. Okay. So I, I went back to my own business. I had to go back there. And I'm back on television. Uh, we're separating the women from the children. We're putting the children in cages at the border. OK, Fox News, yeah, Obama did that. OK, whatever. Let's look at the optics of it. It's not great optics, and it's very un-American. How do you feel about it, Anthony? I don't like it. The president should not do that. He should change the policy. OK, the press is the enemy of the people. How do you feel about that, Anthony? Well, you know what? The press is not the enemy of the people. I wrote an op-ed in The Hill. You can read it last year. The press in a free democracy is a guardian of that democracy, and it holds people in power accountable because power is very corruptive. In addition, the free press and the free world creates all this economic innovation because you teach a child to speak and think freely. And then they go on and create Facebook and Google and all these magnificent companies. When you are censoring the press and you are eliminating parts of the internet and you're telling your children they can't talk about their political leadership, you're stunting their intellectual innovative growth. So I wrote that. He didn't like that. Didn't like it. He's then in Helsinki with uh, President Putin, and he's saying that he's disavowing the information from the intelligence agencies. We had actually a conversation uh, the day after. I said, sir, that is really bad. I said, you know, you remember when de Blasio 
the two cops got shot in Brooklyn, and he went after the cops, and they all turned their back on him. That's going to happen to you. You can't talk like that. These, you may be mad at Comey and Clapper and uh, Brennan, but you can't be mad at the guys on the street that are keeping America safe. It's just a really bad optics. Okay, people don't like talking to him like that, right? So he listened. He said, okay, fine. He walked it back a little, but he didn't really because he doesn't know how to do that. I've only heard Trump apologize three times. You want to hear the three times? Go ahead. Okay. Uh, one, October 7th, 11.58 p.m. <laughs> Ready? In front of a camera like this, he said, I'm very sorry. It was the Access Hollywood night. Apologized to his wife and the American people. Number two, July 2018, he leaned over to Theresa May, leaned over, said, you know, I'm sorry I took that interview with the tabloid. Some of you are... British, you may remember, yeah. he made the prime minister look bad in the tabloid. And the third time that he apologized, he apologized to the original Pocahontas family for comparing Elizabeth Warren to Pocahontas. Because <laughs> I just want to apologize to the family. That was a very bad comparison, okay? Other than that, I've never heard the guy apologize, right? So, so you know, it's fine. So now we're moving on. And then he goes after the congresswoman. Goes after the congresswoman. They are, some of them are African-American, one's yeah. Hispanic. Three of them are born in the country, one's a naturalized citizen. All four democratically elected to the House of Representatives go back to the country that you originally came from. Now, that is an American racist nativist trope. Okay, they told my grandmother, go back to the country that you came from. Now, my grandmother produced three children, my mom and two World War II veterans. My uncle Anthony, who I'm named after, was wounded on Normandy Beach. He got the award from the French. He got the Purple Heart from the United States. My 94-year-old uncle Sal fought in the Ardennes. He was in the Battle of the Bulge. Should my grandmother have gone back to the country that she came from? And I told Rudy, I am not disavowing my personal integrity and my personal family history to support that. He's moving the goalposts on you, and he's moving the goalposts on America, and he's gaslighting everybody, and that is a racist comment. Okay, and I'm sorry, I don't like it. So now I'm on the Bill Maher show. I'm defending the guy. There's 26 letters in the alphabet. I've defended him 25 for 25. Catherine Rampell from the Washington Post turns to me, what about the racist comment about the, Senate, the, uh, the, the representatives? I can't defend that. I'm sorry, that is racism. I wish the president wouldn't say that. I'm now in the post-production party. Bill Maher's <coughs> popping a beer. He looks over at me, he says, you think Trump watched that? I said, I don't, I, don't, I don't think so. My wife then interjects, she says, are you kidding me? You two jackasses on TV, live television? Of course he watched it. <laughs> so then Bill turns to me and he says, you're in trouble. I said, I'm in trouble. He said, yeah, you're in trouble because you were defending him 25 for 26. You got to go 13 for 10 for Trump. That's demagoguery. Right? There's a purity test in that. 25 or 26 isn't enough. He's going to come after you. Okay. The next day, I'm drinking a pina colada at the cabana at the Beverly Hills Hotel. He's firing shots at Bill Maher. I'm like, oh, my God, he definitely watched this thing, right? At 7 p.m., he starts attacking me. You ever been attacked by the President of the United States on Twitter? It's not fun. Okay, it's very unnerving, okay? There's, you've never felt more alive in your life than when you've been called an unstable nut job by the President of the United States on Twitter. <laughs> never felt more in your life. You're as white as this back panel here. I went into the restaurant at Craig's, I washed my face, and then I started firing back. Hey, I gave this guy three years of my life, unbelievable amount of money, hundreds of hours of media support. He's coming after me. Someday he's going to come after you, and he's coming after the country. He didn't like that. So then he fired back at me. And then I fired back at him. I think I called him like Fidel Adolf Trump, the notorious FAT, something like that. You know, I'm in New York, all right? I'm firing back at him, right? And then he didn't like that, right? So then he goes, then he goes after my wife. He goes after my wife. But that was, that was the, the, the straw okay, that broke so the So then he on. goes after my wife, guys. He knows my wife and I are fighting over me working for him. She files for divorce. We're getting tabloided. It's a total freak show. I've reconciled with her. And he's attacking my wife on Twitter. You can go look it up. So then I said, OK, that's it. This guy's nuts. So I went on CNN. I said, this is Trump Noble, man. This is like the first two episodes of Chernobyl. Remember when the reactor, the reactor's melting. The apparatchiks are running around. They don't know if they can clean it up or cover it up. But they're going to work on the cover up first. 
<laughs> then they tell him, OK, you're going to irradiate the entire Eurasian continent, and you're going to blow up the Black Sea. They said, we better clean the goddamn thing up. I said, well, that's going to be the Republicans. Trump's nuts. He's going to do something ridiculously stupid. He's going to blow up. And they're going to decide whether they're going to clean it up or cover it up. And that's where I got things wrong, because I thought they were going to clean it up. I thought that they were going to look at the disavowal of the oath of the Constitution and the lawlessness and the recklessness, and they were going to say, no mas. But they didn't. But he won't be so, impeached, will he? He won't be impeached, but he should be. And what we know about the fragility of our system is one demagogue can subvert but the he system. But he won't be impeached, and he will win the next election, won't he? Well, that's not going to happen. So you know why I know that's so not going to happen? It, so so more, we're going to have a bet on that. You know, we're going to have a bet on that. Let's bet on that. Okay, you know why that's not going to happen? Because everybody here at Davos thinks it's going to happen. <laughs> okay, and this is the contrary indicator place on planet Earth. Yeah, because know. in 2000, I was told in 2007, we have a limitless growth. Okay, that didn't work out. And then I was told here in January 2016, Secretary Clinton's the 45th president. No one else needs to run. Donald Trump has no shot at the nomination. I was told that here at Davos, Switzerland. Did that happen? But 85% of these people think he's...